The strongest objection that Protestants have against the papacy is that the rock is Christ. The rock is not Peter, it's Christ. So in this video, I want to answer a comment that I got on one of my videos and explain exactly what the church is teaching on this is. And you may be surprised to find out that there are several church fathers who actually agree with the Protestant stance on this. So let's take a look. This is the comment I got on one of my videos. It says this, For the one billionth time, Peter is not the rock, Christ is. What the church is built on is that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah spoken of in the Old Testament. He is the son of the living God. It was Peter's declaration of this granted to him by the Father in heaven that Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. This is illustrated not just because of context and understanding, but the Holy Spirit wrote the New Testament in Greek. And in the verse in question, Peter and rock are two completely different words. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Peter is not the rock, Christ is. That is her direct claim. And we see this in the scriptures, St. Paul says, and the rock was Christ from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So are the Protestants right here? Is Jesus the rock or is Peter the rock? So before I answer that question, I want to take a look at a couple other parables from the scriptures. So in the scriptures, in the book of Revelation and in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the apostles are called the foundation of the church. This is from the King James Bible, so I'm not quoting a weird Bible. I'm quoting the Protestant scriptures. It says this, The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So what do we see here? We see the apostles are called the foundation of the church. But then St. Paul says something else, which seems to contradict this. St. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, from the King James Bible again, says this, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what is St. Paul saying? St. Paul is saying that the apostles are the foundation of the church, and Christ himself is the cornerstone. If you don't know what the cornerstone is, it's not a part of the foundation. It's one of the rocks that would go on top of the foundation, and it would orient the entire building. It goes at the corner, and then the way that you place the cornerstone determines the direction of the two walls going forward in right angles. So it's not a part of the foundation. It's towards the bottom, it's, part, it's foundational, but it's not part of the foundation. It directs what's built on top of the foundation. So St. Paul says the apostles are the foundation and Jesus is the cornerstone. And then St. Paul says that Christ is the foundation and there's no other foundation that can be laid other than that of Christ Jesus. Is St. Paul contradicting himself? No, of course not. The problem is, is that we have to be careful not to mix metaphors. The Bible in the Old Testament calls Abraham the rock. And in the New Testament, it calls Peter the rock. And it calls Christ the rock. So who is the rock? Let me give you another example from the scriptures. Leaven. Leaven in the scriptures is used as an analogy, as a parable that Christ tells about the kingdom of God. Leaven's a good thing. And leaven is also used to symbolize the pride and the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. So in the scriptures, leaven is a good thing and leaven is a bad thing. Why? Because they're metaphors using the same imagery, but referring to different things. So if a Protestant comes up to you and says, Jesus is the rock, you should say, yes. And St. Augustine agrees with you. 100% Jesus Christ is the rock upon which the church is built. He's the foundation of the church. And if somebody comes up to you and says, the apostles are the foundation of the church, because that's what St. Paul says in Ephesians 2.20. You should say, yes, the apostles are the foundation of the church. And if somebody comes up to you and says, Peter is the foundation of the church, Peter is the rock upon which the church is built. You should say, yes, Peter is the rock. Why? Because they're each using similar language to express a different reality. So it's important for us as we're going through this not to mix metaphors. Is Jesus Christ the rock upon which the church is built? Yes. Is Peter the rock upon which the church is built? Yes. And think about this for a second. If you're Jesus Christ and you want to tell people that you are the rock upon which the church is built, why would you change Peter's name to signify that you are the rock? Why would you change somebody else's name to signify that you're the rock? Whenever God changes Abram's name to Abraham, 
He changes his name to signify what he is. He changes his name to Abraham, which means the father of nations, because Abraham is the father of nations. In the same way, Christ changes Peter's name to Rock, to Peter, because Christ is signifying that Peter is the Rock. And the point she's making about Peter being a different word than Rock is in Greek, there's Petros and Petra. And the argument that Protestants will make is that Petra signifies big rock, foundation rock, large boulder, stone. Whereas Petros signifies pebble, small stone, throwing stone. So what Jesus is saying is that you are Petros, tiny little pebble, inconsequential. That's what you are, Peter. And I am Petra. I am the foundation of the church. Once again, I think that that interpretation can be held. But it doesn't negate the fact that Jesus literally signifies that Peter is the rock. In scriptural interpretation, there are sort of two layers to it. There's the literal interpretation, and you don't really need an interpreter to get the literal interpretation. The literal interpretation of the book of Exodus is that Moses crossed the Red Sea. You don't need somebody to explain to you what it means that a man parted the sea and walked through it. We understand what those words mean, and we understand what they signify. But deeper than that is the spiritual sense of the text. The way it works, according to St. Augustine, is God uses in the scriptures words to signify realities, like the crossing of the Red Sea, and then he uses realities to signify other realities. He uses historical, concrete realities to signify spiritual realities. And we see this used in the New Testament. Peter uses the historical event of the flood to signify truths about baptism. So can there be multiple spiritual interpretations of the text? Absolutely. However, the fundamental sense of scripture that needs to be upheld always is the literal. And the literal sense of this text is that Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. So perhaps she's right that the gospel of Matthew was written in Greek. There are some early church historians, including Jerome, who thinks that the Gospel of Matthew was originally written in Aramaic because it was written to the Jews. But even if we grant that it was originally written in Greek, it certainly was not spoken in Greek. Whenever Jesus was talking to his apostles and it was just them, there's a 0% chance, virtually, that he would have spoken any other language but Aramaic. Jesus was a Jew and his 12 apostles were all Jews. So he speaks the Jewish language. He speaks Aramaic. And in Aramaic, the word that he would have used for Peter is kepha, which is also what Paul calls Peter most of the time in the scriptures. And in Hebrew, in Aramaic, there's no distinction between big rock and small rock. It's just rock, kind of like we have in English. So what Jesus literally would have said to Peter in Aramaic, because that's the language they were certainly speaking, is, you are kepha, and on this kepha I will build my church. Jesus literally would have said, you are rock, and on this rock, I will build my church. There's no distinction between those two words in Aramaic. So why in the written gospel is Petros used instead of Petra? The answer is, is that Greek is a gendered language. In English, our words don't have a gender built into them. In Latin and in Greek, they do. So for example, in Spanish, you would say la mesa, which means the table, and it's feminine. And you would say El Sol, which means the sun, and it's masculine. So different nouns that don't have a biological sex do have a gender associated with them. So when the Gospel of Matthew is being written, he writes Petros instead of Petra because Peter is a male. And the masculine version of that word is Petros and not Petra. We see this reflected a little bit in English with words like Joseph and Josephine. It would be inappropriate to call a male Josephine. For the same reason, it's inappropriate to call Peter, in Greek, who is a male, Petra. You would call him Petros. That's why that distinction exists. The next point that's made here is in Daniel, the prophecy of a rock falling from heaven and hitting the statue and then filling the whole world. Was Peter the rock? No, Jesus is the rock who came down from heaven. Once again, I think those words can be adequately interpreted that way. However, I would point out that if you look at where the rock lands in that vision, it lands on top of the statue. And the statue has four layers. The bottom layer signifies the Roman Empire. So this rock that's sent from heaven 
where does it land? It lands on top of the Roman Empire. And where to this day is Peter's body? Rome. Where was the capital of the early church? Rome. Where did Peter and Paul both get martyred? Rome. So I would push back on that and say, yes, Jesus is the rock that comes down from heaven, if you understand the metaphor in one way. However, it seems like a more literal interpretation of that verse is that Peter at least has something to do with it. She continues, Also, when Christ was crucified, the veil in the temple was completely torn. We no longer need a high priest on this earth as a go-between of God and man. Jesus is our high priest, our intercessor, not Peter. Yeah, Jesus is the high priest, and the priests here on earth participate in his priestly ministry. If you're going to hold staunchly to the idea that there's no mediation for men towards God, then you should not pray for other people. Because what you're doing is you're acting as a go-between whenever you pray for your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, etc., etc. So if you're going to hold to that verse 100% completely literalistically, then you may come to the conclusion that prayers for other people is bad, and that's clearly not the case. She continues, Catholics, stop idolizing fellow human beings, whether it be Peter or the other saints or Mary. Jesus Christ is our one means of salvation. No one comes to the Father but through him. Notice it doesn't mention through Peter. Absolutely no man comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. However, Christ has a mystical body. If I walked up to you and I gave you some food and you wanted to thank me for the food that I'd just given you, you wouldn't say thank you to the hand of Cameron, even though my hand is what gave you the food. You would say thank you, Cameron. You're the one that gave me the food. In the same way, whenever we act in a way that's cooperating with the grace of Jesus Christ, we act as members of his body. So whenever I thank an angel or a saint for interceding for me, let's say that the Blessed Virgin Mary obtained some grace for me, and I thank her for it, I'm doing this a similar thing. I'm thanking a part of Christ's body and redounding that glory redounds to the glory of the whole. So Christ operates through his body. Christ operates through the communion of saints. Christ operates through the Blessed Virgin Mary, through priests, through our prayers for one another. Christ is the cause, the efficient cause of all of those things. So whenever I say thank you for praying to me, I just as well could say thank you to Christ for causing you to pray or for giving you the grace to pray. They mean the same thing and our language starts to break down whenever we're talking about these concepts. But to honor Mary is to honor a member of the body of Christ. And to honor the body of Christ is to honor Christ himself. So just to sum this up real quick, Peter is the rock. Jesus is the rock. The apostles are the foundation. Jesus is the foundation. The leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy and pride. The leaven of the kingdom of God is a parable signifying God's love. Okay, we can't mix metaphors when we're reading the scriptures. Otherwise, things get very confusing very fast. Is there a way in which Christ is the rock and the church is built upon Christ and he is the foundation? Yes. Is there a way in which the apostles are the foundation of the church and the church is built upon the apostles? Yes. Is there a way in which Peter is the rock and the church is built upon Peter? Yes. If we try to mix these metaphors together, we're just going to end up hopelessly confused. We need to take the words of the scriptures and apply them with reason. So I just wanted to make a quick video responding to that comment. I hope I did so charitably and humbly. It's not my intention to cause any division. And I think that Protestants are correct in saying that Christ is the rock, and I have nothing against that. I would just say that there's an added literal meaning that we can't negate or do away with. So let me know, how did I do? Did you like my answer, not like my answer? Leave a comment letting me know, and leave a comment asking me a question. Hopefully I'm gonna start doing more of these videos where I just sit down, take a couple minutes, and answer some of your questions. And if you wanna join me and a group of other men in praying the rosary daily, then click on the link in the description, and I'll see you there.